All right, welcome back. Welcome back to Old Let's Talk About It. I met with Crawley, a.k.a. King Crawley, and this is the King Crawley Network. If you're new here, I ask that you take a moment to hit that subscribe button. And if you've been here before, welcome back. You are appreciated. All right, today, I want to tell my story. You know, if you've been here before, you see that there's a variety of content on my channel. And... A lot of it touches on non-religious topics. And, you know, I've had different ones on to discuss with them parts of my experience along with their experience. And we've made certain points about different areas of it. But I'm sure that, you know, everyone that follows my channel doesn't know me personally. And even those that do know me personally, a lot don't even know the story. Or the reasoning a person comes from such a religious background to one that doesn't deal with religion at all. You know, and of course people try to relegate your feelings to their level of understanding of it. Oh, you were just hurt by church people or you ain't studied the Bible enough or whatever their limited processes can come up with. They try to put that on you as if you're limited by that or if the if that was the only reasoning that you could have for removing yourself from something that's really harmful. Okay, so at the time of this video, I'm 42 years old. I come from a family, you know, as far as children, three, with me being the oldest son, but I'm the middle child. I have an older sister and a younger brother. Um, church was all I ever really knew. As far back as I can remember, my father was always a preacher. But by the time I was six years old, he became the pastor of, of St. John Church of God in Christ. I'm a Kojic preacher's kid. Um, if you see me keep looking down, I got some notes written down just so I keep the story kind of on track because it's a, it's a few different details and turns and stuff that I could take in telling the story. And I don't want to just be all over the place. Um... Now, at that age, going back to what I said, sometimes as an adult, if you step away from church or whatever, people will relegate your feelings or your reasoning to, oh, that was church hurt. Not realizing even at a young age, six, seven years old, I saw how messed up church people could be. When one of the missionaries from the church would call the house talking crazy to my mama. I saw that at a young age, so I saw church hurt young. A lot of people wouldn't have to experience that because you didn't have a first lady for a mother. Yo, I went to church, was cool, might have been involved, but a lot didn't have the pastor and the first lady as their parents. Okay, now prior to going to St. John, we started off at St. Paul, Church of God in Christ. And... The way my father became the pastor of St. John, we were at St. Paul. But, like I say, this was my first experience of, of seeing church stuff. We were at St. Paul. My father was a minister or whatever. St. John already had a pastor. They had their thing going on. But we were all up under the same umbrella called the, the Southern District of the ju Third Jurisdiction of the State of Virginia. <laughs> of which the pastor of St. Paul was the superintendent over the Southern District. So we was at the church at the time, as far as the area goes. They had some type of issues at St. John. That church split into two churches. Well, the current pastor went off and started a church called Friendship Church of God in Christ. And one of the associate pastors went off and started his church called St. James Straightway Church of God in Christ. I'm only naming that for those that do know to verify that what I'm saying is true. So in there being an absence of having a pastor there, my father was appointed the pastor back in 1986. Now, he wasn't just welcome with open arms because now some people did, but you got to realize that was kind of like a family church. It was a lot of family ties and stuff there. So some of the people that remained 
they thought that they should have been or somebody they approved of should have been the pastor at the time or been in charge. So one lady, which was a shepherd for the devil, she made it a point to make my father's pastorship and hard the whole time he was there, at least most of it anyway, especially at the beginning. So, okay, we go from a church that's fascinating as a young kid. You got everything there. The best pastor. The choir is banging. I even started playing the drums because of the drummer that was there. Shout out to Sean Pitt. He's the reason, he's the first one I saw that made me believe. At four years old, I remember that part. That's the only remember I, memory I have from that early. As early as four years old, I remember seeing him play and knew then I could play the drums. And that's probably the only memory I have from that age. <laughs> okay. Banging choir, banging auxiliaries, you got the... You're sewing circle and you got the mother's board and you got the press. You got all these different circles and usher board and Sunday school, just everything. You got farmers and contractors in the congregation, electrician. My father was a salesman. You got nurses. You just, you have people that can sew and people that can cook and gardening. You have a variety of people all in that one church. So it seemed like everything was perfect. To go to a church that didn't want you there and that like in the wintertime it was so cold you had to sit by the, the little gas heater that you liked to pilot and, and kind of sit by that until it warmed up a little bit. You go from a church that has a lot of members, active members, young men, young women, older men, you know, older women, vice versa, middle age, all in one roof to a church that after all the damage was done when they split, you got a handful of members. That's a lot to process even as a young child. Like, are we being punished or is this, it's made to seem like it's a good thing that he's the pastor of a new church, but the pastor of what? That's like saying, okay, I'm going to make you, we can, I'm the king over here over this whole nation. I, I'm going to go make you the king over an abandoned island. You the king, though, know, but ain't but three people over there. But you the king. We had yeah, absolutely yeah. no musicians the whole time that we were there. Now, for a minute, my father, you know, he, from what I understand, as a young man, he play, he messed with the guitar some. So some Sundays he would fiddle faddle with that. But then around the age of maybe between 10 and 12, I, I can't really remember. I was allowed to start playing the drums because I had been in my mind and practicing to myself knowing that I could play, but I never really had the opportunity. So around that age, I became the musician of St. John for years. Whatever song was sung, whatever came through, I was the musician. And I believe that's what set my passion apart from some of the other drummers in the area. Because think about it. It was a lot of good drummers. But they had the backing of great lead guitar players, bass guitar players, organ players, piano players. Me, I had to know the music. I had to know how the music felt. Because my goal was to play the song on the drums in a way that you still felt like you heard the rest of the music. So my connection to drumming might have been different than some of the other people because the music was literally in my head all the time. I had to have it there. I had to listen to songs a different way. I had to listen to breaks a different way. That's why I never so much focused on being all fancy, which I could do that stuff. I wanted to make sure you felt the beat. I wanted to make sure you felt what I was doing. So once I got to play with musicians, Man, I was in heaven. But anyway, I digress. So you go from seeing some of the best musicians, or at least to the, at that time what you thought were, to becoming the music. Okay. Okay. Th there's no way I'll be able to tell my full story in one setting. There's just no way. There's just too much parts, too many parts to it. But I'm going to try to give a brief timeline so you know how, like I said, a young man, preacher's kid all his life, 
goes to what some might consider now like a heathen, a prodigal son, a reprobate. All those churchy cuss words y'all use to talk shit about people when you no longer agree with their lifestyle. It's not that the people's lifestyle is wrong. It's just based on how you were taught. You use those words to pretty much say fuck them. So I'm, I'm telling y'all, if y'all out there listening, when people start calling you words like you carnal minded or the things of that nature, that's church cussing. That's them saying you ain't shit to them, but in a churchy way, in a way where they can't get punched in the face. But I know what it is, so you're not going to call me that. But anyway, I'm not a violent person. I'm just saying, you can't church cuss me, and I don't recognize what it is. Anyway, okay. Here's where we start moving forward with some. And I really wish my mother was here to verify what I'm saying. Because she knew at a young age that I was even questioning things then. I've always been a one been one to buck dumb rules. I never liked dumb rules. I don't care who they came from. Especially if you're an adult and at the time I'm young, I'm thinking you're supposed to know better. You can't just give me dumb rules and I, I just be like, oh, why? Right. So my mother was standing in my doorway, you know, for what seemed like Al was talking to me. Because my mind was always, I was frustrated. I wanted to know, like, why things got to be this way? Why I got to be that way? This don't make sense. So even back then, I would tell her, like, Mama, but that's stupid. Just certain things within the church, certain rules. Not even so much on the, the biblical parts yet, but just how people were conducting themselves. But they say they were supposed to be something different. How the world, I was already seeing how the world that was really out there was different from the one y'all were presenting me. Which y'all were presenting me one that y'all felt was the best one for me. But it's different from what I'm seeing out here. So even at a young age, I began to question. And not to say my mother ever fully disagreed with me on a lot of stuff she did, but she wasn't in a position to agree with me either, which I know she did on some things. There were some rules and things going on that were stupid. The way some of the members treated her, I would let her know, like, no, they don't get to just do that. They don't get to just talk to you any kind of way. But she couldn't fully agree with that because of the position she was in. She the first lady. She got to rock with the pastor. I respect that. As a mother, as a woman, as a wife, as a first lady, she fulfilled her role. She was strong within her role, and she was strong within her role of being with the pastor, with the father, with the man, with the husband. You know, but even she knew I questioned things. Um, okay, but let me back, back, let me back up just a second. A little bit prior to that, another thing that began to at least pique my interest. I didn't go with it at the, at the time, but it piqued my interest. Or was my first introduction to something outside of Christianity is when we connected with my, my first cousin. Um, Montella Mason, AK, better known as Supreme Mason now. Then go by his government name. He's Supreme Mason. When we first met, you know, at Younger, he was Muslim. His mother, you know, everything, they were Muslim on that side. So you have the direct contrast, Christianity, Muslim. Jehovah, Allah. Now, like I said, it didn't necessarily pique my interest at that time because Jehovah had been pounded in our head so much that, shoot, to us, Jehovah was like Stone Cold Steve Austin in all respect, but Allah was like Coco Beware or something. It's like, you, yeah, you Allah, but you ain't Jehovah though. You ain't out here slaying them like Jehovah though. You ain't beasting like Jehovah. You ain't saying that you took, they prayed you and you took five, what, two fish, five loaves of bread or something ridiculous and fed 5,000 people. You ain't do that, though, Allah. So that man, we was the, especially if you Kojic, you church of God in Christ, you the shit. You the 
the top, you're the top of the Pentecostal holiness thing in our mind, unless you PAW, because that was like Bloods and Crips back then, Kojic and PAW. Church folks that's listening, y'all know what I'm talking about, and y'all know what I'm saying valid. It was Kojic, PAW, and Baptist fell up under that. If you was Baptist, you almost won't save to us. Because y'all could smoke on the church property, still take your little drink, might cuss a little bit, do what you do. You didn't shout. So adding all that together, we like, they ain't even save over there. They died Pepsi over there, baby. Ain't nothing like the real thing over here. They died Pepsi over here. So it was Kojic, PAW, and then everything else. So going back, adding that to the fact that, okay, add that with what I already said. I hadn't fully connected with the, the Muslim part or considering it yet, but it was back there. Add that to what I said. I was already expressing to my mother some concerns. Fast forward to early to mid teenage years. Early 90s. The Wu-Tang Clan came out. End of the 36 Chambers came out in 93. And somebody might say, why are you talking about Wu-Tang in the middle of you telling your story about religion? It factors in. I'm, I'm about to tell you. Now, you're at that age where your mind is still impressionable. You're still trying to find your way. You're still trying to find where you fit in. You're still trying to find what resonates with you within the culture that you're in. You know. Of course, there was different music that was out at the time. But for some reason, with me being a drummer, with my love of music, first of all, it was something about RZA's production. I had never heard beats done that way. For example, in Bring the Ruckus, especially that, for one, when the, when the beat first changed, when the those dog piano chords came in, that was sick. Then at the end, when Jizza came in, that was hard. But then the part of the end where it sounded like it went off beat, it went off track. But if you count it, it wasn't off track. But I had never heard a producer do that. I was like, is this off beat? I was like, but this is ill, even if it's off beat. But then I was counting as it did it. I was like, but it's not off beat. Anyway, so I fell in love with his production first. Sampling drums and all of that stuff. But then as I began to listen to the words, it started connect to connect back to some of the things I would hear my cousin say as far as the Islamic faith was concerned. But at the time, my cousin was full Muslim. They were 5%. So initially, I wanted to know, okay, so what's the difference? And I'm not going to attempt to sit here and say I'm super knowledgeable about either one. But I'm just sharing my experience within it. What I did learn from listening to Wu Tang and from learning about the five percent nation, gods and earths, you know, nation of gods and earths and things of that nature, that they believed the black man was God, that we were the gods, that it was in us. So that was the first time I'd even heard the possibility of God being able to exist, the God that was out here, all out here. Being able to exist as in here, as this, through this, with this. First time I'd ever heard that. And of course, first hearing it, you reject it because all you heard was Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Sidkindu, you know, Jehovah Rophar, all of those, all the Jehovah nicknames that they've given him to claim that he is or it is or whatever. It's funny how they say God is not man that he should lie, but you call God he all the time. But God is not man. So how are you assigning roles that are specific and to genders of humans to a supreme being that's not a human? Another subject probably. But anyway, I, I began to wonder and, and I was intrigued by, okay, so the black man is God. And at that stage of my life, you know, that's kind of the age where the teenagers, we start to kind of buck a little bit against some of the rules and explore other thoughts outside of the ones our parents may have given us. So that was perfect for me. The black man is God. 
what? So let me learn more about this. So as I would hear more of their music, you know, they speaking about the mathematics and, you know, think the lessons and, you know, what's today's mathematics, you know. Um, learning about Yakub, the big-headed scientist, and um, just everything. Everything that was that was connected to that. Um, and every day, we were digging deeper and deeper, trying to learn more about what these things meant. Like I said, what's today's mathematics? Um, learning about the weather, what makes rain, hail, snow, and earthquakes. It even takes you into the science, sciences where you start to learn about helium, xenon, argon, neon, freon, because you're hearing these things in the lyrics. So you're learning about, I, actually at that stage of my life, I was learning more through their music about life and science and how things actually worked than I was learning at school. They, they had the periodic table at school, but I just quoted that from a RZA lyric. I didn't learn about that at school. I learned about stuff on the periodic table through listening to Wu-Tang lyrics. That might sound crazy, but you ain't a fan like me. Okay, let's fast forward some. Now, I got those things in my mind. I get with my oldest kid's mother at the time, you know, we were young. So I'm still weighing. I got, of course, I got Christianity right here because that's all I've known. But I got this new information I'm starting to learn. But I hadn't quite come out with it yet, but it's, it's there. It's there. I'm contemplating like, what is this? What is this? What is this? So her and I are together. And as we progress, and I'm studying more over here, I, I open up and let her know, like, look, this is where I'm at with it. I'm not with all that Jesus is Lord stuff. I'm not with all that Jehovah and church stuff. Now, mind you, this was my first time. So some people know me now and think this was my first time walking away from Christianity. No, it's not. Like I said, I've always questioned it. I just didn't know what options I had. I didn't know leaving it was an option. I didn't know leaving religion totally was an option till later in life. Let me go back to the story. So, of course, that brought some friction because she grew up Baptist. But more so, it was a family church. So everybody there was connected in some type of way. So it was more about the community. It was about the church too and the belief, but it was about the community of it. So above the knowledge, sometimes people can't let go of that community because if I don't go to church, where do I go? I understand that. If that's something you've been doing for years and years with some of the same people for years and years, and then you say, okay, well, I'm not doing this no more. What do I do? How do I fill that hole right there? I get it. So we go along, and at this time, my cousin and I, we're hanging together more. My brother's in the picture, another one of our homeboys. We're all hanging together more, you know, throughout high school up through this period. And we would just have the deepest conversations, particularly myself and my cousin, because I'm just trying to learn. I'm trying to draw from what he's already known because he's been on the path a little longer. So I'm, I'm trying to draw from the information he already has to know, to, to, to say, okay, Christianity is teaching me this, but over here, it makes more sense. So even back then, there was things making more sense than Christianity. So I was, you know, going along with that. Along this time frame, I felt the need to start selling weed. I was working at Purdue. You know, one of my homeboys, what up, Gus? You know, we would get off on Fridays, go down to Norfolk, Chesapeake area, because that's where they from. Go to the spot. Going down there, like, drinking that Remy in the green bottle. Coming back with at least 
Like I said, I wasn't super big time. But he coming back with at least a half a pound. I got a little QP. Y'all ain't heard that in a long time. I got a little QP on me. Not nothing huge, nothing too crazy. But enough to get us both in jail if, if we had got stopped. So we was doing that for a minute. You know, we work at Purdue during the week. Friday we get off. You know, I go shower. I go pick him up from Resty. We hit 58. You know, go do the, you know what I'm saying, not me. And we get hot and giraffe titties coming back. It was one night. I still don't know how we got back. Drinking that Remy, smoking that good weed. To this day, I don't know. I just know I woke up the next day and I was like, Phew, we made it. So we were doing that. Like I said, I felt the need to smoke to, to sell weed, which I didn't have to. But I figured, why not make a few extra dollars? I know a lot of people smoke weed. I can kind of, you know, I ain't trying to be big time. But let me sell a couple nickel bags, a couple dime bags or something. One night, one evening, myself, two of my other homeboys, we decided they linked up with some chicks from over Carolina. We decided we're going out to eat with them. Now, I don't know these chicks. I'm just rolling. I don't know what's going on. We get to the restaurant, everybody eat or whatever. Now, this was kind of petty of me. But I didn't know these chicks. They didn't. I'm thinking everybody, we just hanging out, everybody paying for their own meal. They trying to sign one of the chicks for me to pay for. And I'm like, nah. Now, imagine, I'm young. I was young then. I'm not talking about now because I, I wouldn't leave a lady just out there hanging like that if you with the group. But I was like, nah, I ain't, I ain't doing that. We rolled out. Anyway, we ended up going back to their spot, chilling out, hanging, smoking, whatever, whatever. Coming back, my homeboy, one of my homeboys riding with me. I dropped him off at home. Coming back through town, I rolled through the stop sign. Right down Atlantic Street. Like, right there by the, uh, Passing an old pizza hut that stop sign right there by the by the subway joint and gas station right there. Now of course that stuff went right there then. I, I rolled through and Clary stopped me. I'm saying his name because he was a dickhead that night. I was living in my her apartments. He pulled me over like right there beside it. You know, and I wasn't smart. I, I didn't know what I could or didn't have to allow them to do. Anyway, let him search the car. I had the weed on me, whatever, whatever. Got arrested, spent the night in jail. He was talking, talking stupid. That's why when I see him now, I don't even speak to him because I was a young man. I was barely an adult and you talking crazy to me. But anyway, caught the weed charge. All of this is factoring in. Spent the night in jail. Called my folks, whatever. They eventually came and got me out sometime the next day. And, um, at the time, I'm still up in the air. I ain't know. Like, I don't know if God failed me or if I'm fucking up for God. I, I ain't know. I'm just up in the air. I, my mind was just all over the place because I had so much information trying to process, trying to figure out life. So, okay, my first time going to court. Now, mind you, back then, and when I tell people now, they don't believe me. I used to have cornrows and everything, you know, my oldest kid's mother actually learned how to braid hair. Braiding my hair. So if she ever braided y'all hair or my kid's hair, she learned how braiding my hair back in the day. Yes, I used to have cornrows. I know with my waves and stuff now, you can't tell that, but I used to have cornrows. So, first time going to court, I didn't have a job. Like you say, I was looking thuggish. I wasn't in school, wasn't in Southside or nothing like that. So the judge told me, he's like, look, when you come back before me, you better have a job, you better be in school. Simple enough. So I went, got me a nice little haircut, had an interview. I think that's when I started working at Beach Mold and Tool. And I enrolled back in Southside. So when I went back to, uh, went back to see the judge, you know, now hold up before I get to that part. 
in the process of me going back and forth to court, my mother passed in uh, that October. My next court date went to January. So my mother passed thinking her son was in trouble. That kind of messed with me over time because I was in the midst of trouble going back and forth to court for what was potentially a felony charge because my charge was possession with intent to distribute. I was selling weed. So my mama passed with me thinking her son might go to jail. You know. So I got that on my mind. I'm questioning God and everything then. Like, you let the last image of me seeing my mother be with her. Laid up on the bed with tubes coming out of every part of her body that I could that I could imagine, that I could see. With a machine controlling how her chest rises and falls. That's the last image you let me see of, of my mother, but you love me. And even at 42, that image is burned in my brain. But you love me, though. Okay. So she passed in that process. Like I said, my mind's still all over the place. Go back to court that January. I had a job. I had enrolled back in school, even though I wasn't really doing it. I was in school. My father was supposed to come to court, but somehow he didn't make it to court. Yeah. Um, but anyway, and the funny part is, and my lawyer, she did nothing. We got in there, and I, I had a lawyer, but I defended myself. Thankfully, and here's where the church stuff kicked back in. According to the final paperwork, because I did what the judge said, got in school, got a job or whatever, he dismissed it. And on the paperwork, it said that it was one gram short of being a felony charge. So in my mind, that must be God. He must be looking out for me. Well, if that's the case, you would have looked out for me from the, from the start of it, right? I wouldn't have got locked up or none at all if that was the case. Why have to be just one gram? It's like because of the way we program, this this guy we, we are taught about always got to get us right to the edge of fuck up. Let me get you as close to the edge of fuck up before I show you I'm real. That's kind of that's kind of narcissistic. That's a narcissistic quality, y'all. Let me get you right to the edge of fuck up to show you I'm in control of this. To make sure you know I'm in control. But I, I thought I, I thought I knew you was in control. Anyway, like I said, I'm not gonna be able to cover everything in one second. So that's when the church shit kicked back in. But deep down, I still knew something wasn't right. Something there was something different out there. So I kind of got back into church, kind of by mistake, but for the love of playing the drums. I was the drummer at my my kid's mother, soon to become wife, wife's church. Like I said, it was a Baptist church. So I was going to church for the love of playing the drums. They really won't pay me nothing like that for real. Because drummers don't get a lot of respect. I don't know how they really doing it 2021, but my whole life coming up drumming. If the drummer got paid. The drummer got paid less than all the other musicians. The keyboard player probably got the most. You know, the guitar, whatever, whatever. They got whatever. But the drummer, out of if you're getting paid, the drummer usually got the least amount. And kind of did a lot of the work. We're the heartbeat of the band. We're that thump. When they shouting, I've heard a lot of breaks in shout music. But most of them include the drums just rocking. Not just the organ. The drums usually rocking. Because we the heartbeat of everything. Anyway, so I was at church. And I was hoping. I was actually almost hoping it worked. But like I said, I was at a Baptist church where. Great people. Excellent people. Family people. But they were going through the formality of church. So 
the program was pretty much going to be what the program said. It won't going to be nobody that scream out hallelujah and take off running at no point during the service. It won't going to be nobody that testify and, 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 and start singing a song and turn the whole church up and the church shout for 35 minutes to an hour at no point. But that's what I grew up on. I grew up at in the church where at any given time, the Holy Ghost might take over and the Spirit might move and that Hammond B3 and all that good stuff get to cranking up and the drums get to doing what they doing and the whole church just be gone for about an hour. Just boom. You know, all of that stuff. I don't even get into it because I still like to play. I still would play the show. I still, that's still with my shit. The preacher, good people, but he never won't gonna really hoop. He was going to hoop to get you hype, but he wasn't going to hoop to get you high enough to get you to... He won't get you there. So I still was like, this sucks. So it made it easy to keep contemplating this other stuff. The other stuff was starting to sound even more better. I'm God. You know what I'm saying? Knowledge, wisdom, understanding. You know. Food, clothing, and shelter being your necessities. That's what you need. I could go into all of that stuff, but I ain't going to try to prove that I was studying it. I was. I was considering it. I didn't have a, you know, an attribute and things of that na that nature. But I was familiar with all the terminology and what the basis of it was. Because that's what I wanted to be. That's what my favorite group was. they still my favorite group. Wu-Tang Forever. Okay. So... I'm going to move on in the story, son. Her and I split. And the day her and I split, I had two options. Now, I was already high as a mug, smoking that good, that good weed. I was either going to get super drunk I was going to go to church. So as high as I was, I went to the church that ended up being like my last church membership. I went to Eleanor Jarrell Worship Center on Liberty, Liberty Road, Emporia, Virginia. And this is the old building. Still look like the positive 15 and all of that. And I remember I sat close to the double door on the side, like right in the back. I had on like a gray shirt with like some print. You know, and, and some jeans and shoes, high as hell. But what I remember is, it felt like the church I grew up on. The music. The songs. Hosanna, blessed be the rock. Songs like that I hadn't heard in years. But from my experience in church, that was church. That felt like church. So it easily could reconnect me to what I thought was right. Like I said, it felt right. It felt like what I was used to. The keyboard player, drums, pastor could preach. And then there was a hell of a lot of women there. It doesn't get any better than that. All the girls that would turn up on Friday and Saturday night was at El Norgerrell on Sunday. Let the church say amen. Hey, y'all. That's a fact, though. I ain't even trying to be funny. All the pretty girls, all the cute girls, you know, they supposed to kind of bend, whatever, whatever. Yeah, they turned up on, on, on the weekend, but on Sunday they was praising the Lord in the same spot I was in, El Norgerrell. So that was appealing. Because more nothing like a wild church girl. But anyway. So that process. Because I felt like. Okay you get to be around people that recognize you. And then shortly after I started going. The lady that ended up becoming my mother-in-law. She would tell me. You know she would. I start. You know. Her niece was the drummer at the time. They would start allowing me to play songs. They would start allowing me to play some. So that was pulling at my, my, my passion strings. Oh, this church dope. And now I get, to, I get to be the drummer behind this dope music and this choir. And I'm like, okay. 
This a church boy dream right here outside of preaching this. Okay. I get to showcase that I'm nice with it because I come from the, the Baptist church where you can't really get busy like that. I get to get busy over here. I know they're going to shout and all that good stuff. Yes. And at some point, I guess the niece, she didn't want to play anymore. She wanted to go and start doing other things within the church. So I was allowed to be the drummer. It didn't really get any better than that. So you're around a community of people that were close, that were always hanging around each other. So you, you started to feel the love. Like my brother now, we have he had the apartment and when my wife and I divorced, I moved in with him. And at the church on Sundays, that was the hangout spot. Uh, several of the women from the church, the girls from the church would come hang out at our crib. That's a fact, you know. Sometimes I might cook some, or we just it's just a hangout spot. We ain't had cable. We watched Friday after next like a thousand times with no problem because it was just a chill spot. And when we first went there, we hadn't stopped smoking weed and stuff, so we were still smoking weed and doing our thing. The girls wasn't. But Crawley Boys was cool, so everybody was just kicking it. You know, eventually that faded off because my brother got involved with who now is his wife. You know, we began to change our lives and stop smoking weed at the time. And, you know, feeling like we're going to dedicate our life more to Christ. Which my brother did it before me. I eventually got baptized and all this stuff. But at the time, it was a lifesaver. Because that's all we know. And that's all a lot of us know. We go through hard times in life. And because Christianity, religion, church is all you've ever been given. That's your default setting. So you go back around people that you're familiar with or things that you're familiar with. And it's comfortable. So you feel like that's help. It's a band-aid. Because the problem is still there. Is just masked by this good feeling, this euphoric feeling of community and things of that nature. So, like I said, I was a drummer. Go along, move along. I ended up dating or being interested in my brother's wife's cousin. When my brother's wife, who was his girlfriend, would come see him. The cousin, they were hanging together. So we were just kicking it at first, whatever, whatever. Anyway, that ended up being who I married the second time. I married my wife's first cousin. But that was based on the pastor literally standing in her mother's kitchen, in my wife's mother's kitchen, saying, y'all need to get married. Now, that's not a knock at her because she was saying that based on how she believed it should be. Me now looking at that, realize it's not my place to ever tell anybody when they should get married because that's such a big decision. I wouldn't tell you to get married or, well, I would probably tell you when to get divorced before I told you when to get married. Because what I've learned is a lot of people don't understand marriage until later on in life. They don't understand what marriage really is. Some make it through that turn where once they learn, they can still stay together. But once some learn, they realize we shouldn't have done this shit. We actually like other things. We actually don't like each other. But by that time, you're invested with kids and all these types of things. So anyway, she became my second wife. And being close to her family, church, things of that nature, it was easier for me to get deeper and deeper back into church. With the knowledge of having seen it all my life, being placed back into that environment made it easier for me to of course, be myself too, but to simply go through the motions and mimic what I had already seen growing up. You got to realize on my father's side, 
it's, it was 12 of them out of seven boys. Six of them were pastors, including my father. One was a deacon, but he should have been a pastor. RIP to Uncle Thomas. He could have been a pastor too. All of them preachers on that side, pastors, not just preachers, most of them pastors. I've seen, you know, because people that, that are hear my story now uh, question, well, maybe you won't really in the church like that, or maybe you ain't studied this enough, or maybe you ain't go enough, or I've seen church at levels that some people won't see, especially if you're not a preacher's kid, especially if you don't come from a family of preachers. Now, don't get me wrong. I've seen some ill stuff in church. I remember one, one family reunion in Jersey. It was at one of the uncle's church. And I don't know if it was my father who was the main preacher. Because they would kind of take turns deciding like who would preach or whatever. But this particular one, you know how MCs, when niggas rapping, you rapping a cypher. Or if you smoking weed or whatever, you smoking a cypher. I see my uncles preaching a cypher. Pastor Mike preaching in a cypher. Wherever one would leave all, he passed it to the next one. He pick it up with the same velocity and strength and power that the, the one prior to him did. And they did that. And it all made sense. But I had never seen nothing like that. I come from that. You know. Man, I ain't gonna even get into the depths of the churchiness. Well, I will at some point that I come from. But I'm qualified to say the things I say because I come from that. That's just like if a person grew up in a household with a doctor or a drug dealer. You're qualified to say what comes from your environment because you come from that. Even if you have other things that are included, you come from that, so you, you're qualified to speak on it. So, like I said, it made it easier for me to get back into the groove of churching. And as I went along, I became more involved in the different auxiliaries, more involved in the different things. I was the first children's choir director at the church. I was Sunday school superintendent at some point. I was choir director at some point, the lead drummer for years. Um, I'm sure I did several other things. I came up with the name King's Men for the men's group today. I know they used to have it. I don't know if they still do, but the group, the King's Men, I came up with the name for that. Um, several things. I was I was deeply involved into church behind the scenes and everything. Different decisions that would be made or gotten made. I was privy to them along with some others before, like, say, the rest of the congregation might have been. I've been in court and seen some things that. See, I don't talk about certain things to protect certain people because I don't have no beef with them now. But I've been around some situations that won't godly from super godly people. And I didn't say nothing because I love them. Even though I haven't always been treated favorably by some, by most, but I kept my mouth closed because I loved them for real. Because... Me being talked about is one thing, but I could put out factual stuff to damage their reputation. What? I don't have to do that. That type of anger don't exist in me no more. Anyway, like I said, so I'm getting deeper and deeper into the church. But as a person, it's not helping me as a person because my wife and I, we always going at it. Because I have issues. I'm not even going to speak about Anything she might have done at this point. Now, I might at some point. But I'm going to just speak about me. Because I can only be accountable for me and the changes I can make. I had some anger issues. Some trust issues. Some, some confidence issues. Not being sure of who I was. Made it easier for me to continually doubt myself. So it's easily to kind of guide me where you needed me to be on certain things. But then on certain things, I was super stubborn. You know, we were constantly at it. Then I was younger, so I wasn't quite at an age. Early on, I hadn't cheated yet, but I wasn't quite at an age where 
I could resist saying something to, you know, a nice little thing if I saw something. So I might have been in an inbox back then or a text or whatever. And she would always find out. <sighs> so, yeah, as far as church went, I, I was the shit. But I was feeling miserably as a, as a, as a husband. Because the facade I was able to put on in church doesn't translate over to real life. Me being able to get up there and turn the drums up doesn't translate. It over. doesn't translate over to how to solve an argument in the middle of the night. Because it's easy to put on the act for people. It's easy to play that role. It's easy to stand up and, and say the right words to make people happy, to make them feel good, to make them praise the Lord, to make them hallelujah. But we can't even decide... Who's supposed to wash the dishes? Who's supposed to be taking the trash out? Who's supposed to be cleaning the bathroom? Just, it, it, it's not translating over. Now, some might say, well, that's your fault. Okay, I'll take that. I, it might have been my fault, but that's what it was at the time. So, great Christian, not such a great husband. Time goes along, you know. Her and I went through a hell of a marriage. I went down to tell the story too. In a way that's respectful, but I, boy, y'all can learn from that one. Boy. Boy, that was, we, we, we. I think we both can laugh about it now. We, we haven't spoken about certain things, but, and she's married, so she's in a position where she can't laugh like she wants to. But I'm still one of the funniest people she know. And I'm not saying it in a disrespectful way, but it's like, it would be cool to have that conversation to laugh about some of this stuff that we did. You know. I, and let's make that more regular too. Let's stop making it so taboo to be cool with people you got kids with. I don't have no beef with my kids' mamas. Now, if they got beef with me, or whatever they might have said to somebody about me, I can't control that. But I don't have no beef with my kids' mamas. They good women. I still love them as, as my kids' mothers. That's it. You know, shouts out to them. They raising some dope kids. Thank you. Of course I'm involved with my kids' life, but I could have picked some of y'all. I love you. Anyway, we progress along. Things get... Really ugly. We owned business in the process. Crawley cleaning service. We had we was cleaning houses. Then had a car wash. Um, she had secured some contracts to clean different buildings like FedEx, PNS, Care Advantage. You know we was doing. We was we was rocking and rolling. You know we was getting the white folks money because we was right there at the old grill washing the cars. So that's where the people was at. So it won't enough for them to bring their nice little BMWs, drop them off. And, like, just bring it back to me when you're done. I'm like, word. But y'all be tripping over your Honda. Anyway. Progressed along. Because, like I said, I'm not going to try to tell that story right now. Her and I went through a bad breakup. <laughs> now, this is where it's going to progress to me leaving the church and leaving religion for good. Okay, so... My second wife and I split up. And it was an ugly breakup. It wasn't cute. After a huge fight, you know, that particular night, I, I chose to leave. And all I had was my backpack and my broken down Cadillac. It didn't work. Now, like I said earlier, we had the business together. And we actually lived, like, right up the street from it. But because of everything that was going on with us, we kind of weren't even working out of the physical location. So we let the power get cut off, water and everything. And I was kind of just doing some of the washing cars from the house. So, you know, I, I, I've said over time, for those that know me, when her and I split up, I was homeless. So initially, that's where I went to sleep in, in that building that didn't have any power or water anything. And mind you, it was starting to get cold in, so it was freezing in there. 
And the thing is, at that particular time, I was still practicing the belief of trying to pray and fast. Like I did all the Daniel fast and every kind of fast you could think of over the year. So I was actively involved over the year with the different traditions and rituals and things that come along with being a Christian, especially in the Pentecostal fashion. So I'm homeless and I'm praying to Jesus to help me out of the situation. I'm having to go to my sister's house during the day, but have her drop me off at the building at night because of some of my irresponsibilities. Over time, I didn't necessarily burn a lot of bridges, but I had damaged some. So even though him and I, we really good, we good now. At the time, my brother-in-law and I weren't seeing eye to eye because of something I did, something I was irresponsible about, which a simple conversation could have fixed it. But I was younger, I was immature, I, I didn't, I wasn't thinking correctly, just was too much going on. So I, I couldn't really be over there, that was that man's house. And if he didn't feel like I respected him enough, he had a right for me not to be there and I, I had to respect that. So I couldn't go there. At the time, I don't think my aunt was living, she had moved out of the area for a minute so I couldn't go there, you know. I really had no other family. My brother didn't live here. Didn't have any other immediate family in the area to go to. So I would be there, or some nights I would sleep at the church. I had a key. I would sleep up in the sound booth during the winter. Didn't cut the the, the heat or anything on. I would, I would cover up with choir robes up in the booth. And then I would come down early enough to go in the bathroom change clothes, get freshened up to go to work at the school because I was a paraprofessional with the special education. So I'm wearing, you know, uh, suits and everything, button-ups and all that good stuff. So like I said, the breakup wasn't pretty. We, we, whoo, we went through some things. But anyway, it came to a point where it was getting too far out of hand. <laughs> And I was a member of the y YMCA at the time, right? So, okay, Hold on. before I get to that, I lived in them two spots. Like I said, I didn't have anywhere to go. And then I ended up, because the guy, I had known him for a little bit, he, he a little crazy, but, well, he a lot crazy. But anyway, I ended up living with a dude that had some, some mental issues, schizophrenic dude. And I did what I was supposed to do. I would pay my part or whatever. And because they had the food bank thing at the church, I would get food and have there. So I, I wasn't freeloading. I was pulling my weight. You know what I'm saying? But then his girlfriend moved there. And this is my honest opinion. I think because I wouldn't give her no energy, she told him to put me out because he would take his medication and go to sleep. She would sit up talking to me. And I'm like, where's she trying to go with this? Like, why are you so talkative now that this man knocked out and you know that, that medicine got him out? But I would never, I would never give her no energy towards that. So one day, I was riding with my brother, I won't say his wife, and maybe her sister, and a few people. We went to a, a Lecrae and a few other people gospel concert in Norfolk. On the way there, this man texted me, when you get back, get your stuff and get out. I'm like, what? Now, mind you, I'm hyped going to the concert. I'm. He wouldn't answer the phone, wouldn't respond to text. He just was talking real greasy. He would text back real greasy, but he wouldn't answer the phone. So literally, after that concert, I had to find somewhere to go. Thankfully, you know, one of the brothers in the church, good people, he had room for me for that night, right? But anyway, so I kind of had to bounce around a few places. I ended up getting my stuff from dude, and he apologized to me to this day. But, but then he had a nerd to still ask me for money sometime. I'm like, dude, 
I should stab you. All the stuff you done done and put me in different situations I've dealt with over time with you. You should ask me for nothing, man. But anyway, so my living arrangement was up in the air for a minute. You know, then finally I ended up staying in the boarding house or whatever. But along that way, going back to what I was saying, it got really ugly. And I was sitting in front of the Y one day. I was being accused of something by my ex. Now, a lot of things had been had been said and we had both done a lot of stuff, but when it got to this point where you you willing to go this far and accuse me of something that you know is not true, just because you know if you say it to the wrong people or to the right people, knowing that you're wrong, that's something that people are going to believe first before they check into it. Okay, so I called the pastor, which happened to be her aunt. And I remember I was sitting in front of the YMCA. At this time, I'm the choir director. I'm still con considered like the lead drummer, but I'm the choir director, doing stuff in the church or whatever. So I called her. I'm like, hey, listen. This is what's being said. All I'm asking is that you call her and just tell her to chill out. Like, you ain't got to get so caught up in it, but she might listen to you. Just call her and be like, look, you know this ain't right. Like I said, because of what was being said, like, even she would have, I'm thinking like, even she would have been like, now, come on, you, you really going too far with this. But she didn't say that. She she gave me one of those. Well, baby, you need you gotta you know you gotta fast and pray more type of responses. And it's at that moment, I heard my own voice that I didn't know was going to speak say, "They don't have the answers. They really don't know the answers. Not just talking about that person specifically." But it was a it was an opening to just that world itself. Like these answers you keep looking for in life, don't none of them have them. Because if you can bring something this serious to someone, where a very simple answer can be given and had that will probably stop it, and you refer back to a programmable cliche answer to give me. It's because you don't have the answers. And realizing that that's what pretty much all of them, how they would respond. Y'all don't even know how to get to the answers or you don't realize that actually just telling the truth is the answer. So at that moment, I told her. And I'm, I'm almost saying word for word. I say, well, I can no longer be a part of your church. And I think she asked me to repeat and I said, I said, I can no longer be a part of your church. I didn't second guess myself. I didn't want her to say that. But as soon as she said that in my mind processed it, that's exactly what I said to her. You know, and I said, you know, a little brief, respectful goodbyes. I got off the phone and I texted the choir members for them to refer to her for any questions that I was no longer the choir director. I didn't answer any text messages about it. Or anything because at that moment I realize I have to seek the answers for myself now mind you my goal was never to walk away from religion my goal was to simply find out the answers in the Bible for myself it said okay maybe they not smart enough maybe they not studying it right maybe they not going deep enough to really get to the answers so, I, so my goal was, okay, this is what I told myself, or the voice myself told myself. It says, seek the truth. And it says, seek the truth regardless to where it takes you. Pretty much saying that regards to what information I come across, I'm not going to automatically shut it out. I'm going to consider it because I'm wise enough to eat the fish and throw away the bones. 
I can lean to my own understanding on a lot of things, even though we're taught to lean not to your own understanding. No, I can trust my intellect on a lot of things. So I'm able to hear something and to decide, hmm, that makes sense. And not reject it just because the Bible don't say that. I remember a guy got upset with me because he going to say he didn't believe in dinosaurs because they weren't in the Bible. Whether they real or not, I, I said, that can't be your basis for not believing in it. Cigarettes ain't in the Bible. Reefer ain't in the Bible. Like, it exists, though. And even if those weren't good examples, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> but anyway, um, so my goal was to, I said, I'm going to study this thing for myself. I'm going to read it. I'm going to get into it. I'm going to look at different translations only to find out there are no original, original translations of the Bible. All we have is copies of copies of copies of copies of translations of translations of translations of versions of versions of versions of God's one and only word. Let me go back and say that again. Because if you think about it, we have copies and copies and copies and copies and translations and translations and translations and versions and versions, i.e. Kings, James, the new life, the living word, the message, all these versions of God's one word. If the word is supposed to be so pure and so understandable, why we got to keep breaking it down for everybody? Well, let me say it like this for you. Or it mean like this over here. Or it mean like this, right? But it's one infallible word. Right? So I began to study. And I'm not going to go through everything I studied and everyone I listened to. But I'm giving you an overview of what got me to this point. And everybody I listened to wasn't non-religious, but I was able to listen to it from with different ears. You know, because I was still listening to people like Bishop George Bloomer at the time, even though he's still a Christian holiness preacher or whatever. It was some of his messages that got my brain to start thinking further because he asked a question, something like this. He said, do you know enough about the Bible to be questioned about it? And it's a simple question. I believe that's how the question went. It's a simple question, but do you know enough about the Bible to be challenged or be questioned about it? Do you? As you're listening to me, do you? Just answer it for yourself, honestly. Do you know enough about the Bible to have any type of open discussion, i.e. debate, not in a negative way, but for your beliefs to be challenged based on what's in the Bible, not what you feel or what you were told or your experience, but based on the Bible. So that made me say, okay, well, you need to study the Bible more. You know scriptures and you know the, the politics and the, the pageantry of it, but do you know what the word really say? So I began to read and study different things and not just the, 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 the concordances and stuff that were automatically told for us to use to go with this because you have certain types of concordances you use and certain type of Bible references that you use that you really don't go outside of those. I started to go outside of those and study other things and listen to different people, different perspectives, only to find out that there were at least, what, 16 other quote-unquote crucified saviors with similar stories to Jesus before Jesus. So... If he the only begotten son of God, who the begotten of these begotten? Because they're supposed to be the begotten of somebody that begot them, and some of them are supposed to be the begotten of God too. So who begot these begotten? So that, but that's a truth that comes out that people will hear it in my Christian mind, in my locked up mind, I say, but Jesus is the only one that died for my sins, and I just start quoting scriptures and there were no other name under the heavens by where men might be saved. And, you know, just start studying to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need him not. You know, I just start kicking out scriptures and programming and cognitive dissonance and hearing the truth that there really are other stories that existed that are very similar to the Jesus story that were uh, existed before this story was even written. So now that I have that truth, I'm responsible for that. I can't just ignore it and go scripture quote over top of that. 
because I have that information now. I can look that up and see that, oh, shit, this story really did exist before Jesus, and it's almost the same story. What do I do with that? I accept it and say, okay, let me dig deeper. Let me find out what else I was told that was this, but it's really not this. And this is only one synopsis of it. But even down to the Christmas thing, the Christmas holiday type of thing, December 25th. Well, first we need to, co we need to connect that to the resurrection of the sun, which we actually, actually celebrate the resurrection in March or April, which I never understood how you can memorialize a, a person that supposedly died on one day in two separate months, just whenever, but that's something to that too. Going back, the resurrection of the sun. Okay, the winter solstice. Happens around December 21st, 22nd. That's when the sun is like at its lowest point in the sky. So we have the shortest day of the year and the longest night. That's like the death of the sun. Shortly after that, the sun begins to turn back or the angle of the degree. I'm not getting into all the science of it. You can do your own Googles. Right after that, it begins to turn back and slowly and gradually our days begin to get longer and our nights begin to get shorter up until it gets to the, the spring. The rising of the sun. So you have the winter solstice, the death of the sun when it's at its lowest point. And then shortly after that, it turns and starts going back. The resurrection of the sun. Because in April and August, we're really, that, that Easter, that's a fertility um pagan festival thing I'm not even trying to get into all the technicals of it because I can do that later I'm just giving you the overview of the story but it's like what do you do with that information once you have it once you realize oh and then to find out if there was a Jesus he wouldn't have been born that time of year my birthday is in August ain't no way you're going to tell me well, we're going to just celebrate it in January nigga. January 25th that is going to be your birthday. August what? We don't care. January, Santa Claus, nigga. Like, do it. It doesn't make sense, y'all. Because but that's how it's always been done. But if, it, if it's been done wrong, why not change the narrative? Why grow up and make more dumb kids? Dumb meaning not knowing. Not saying they're stupid or nothing, but dumb meaning they're not hearing what they need to hear. There's nothing wrong with relearning. There's nothing wrong with saying, I found information that actually makes me more powerful in this, this world that we live in. It doesn't have me locked into a box. Anyway, so I began to listen to different people that would speak about spirituality and God in a different manner than I'd ever heard. So I would listen to people like the late, great Dick Gregory and how he referred to God. Now, some of the people I name, I don't, I no longer listen to them like that because they own some scam, other stuff. But even Dr. Umar Johnson, when I used to listen to his stuff, very intelligent man. But he would speak about us having the power. You know, Dr. Claude Anderson which really wasn't speaking about spirituality, but he was educating me outside of what I've been taught through church. We're taught our blessings come from, yeah, doing good and serving God, but giving your tithes and offering. This man, Dr. Claude Anderson, was breaking down the real economic structure and had a real economic plan, still does, real economic plan on what we as a people can do. He even predicted certain things as far as population went, saying that, okay, at one point we were second class citizens as far as population. It was Caucasian, us, then like the Mexican Latino community. And he predicted by a certain year that we would be number three. And if you look at a lot of the numbers and if you're able to move across the country, yeah, we're the majority in certain sections. But everywhere else, it's not us. You know, so I would listen to information like that and begin to learn. 
Um, I would listen to different. I would listen to atheist uh, podcasts, uh, the atheist experience with with Matthew Dillahunty. And I like a lot of what he said. I still listen to a lot of his stuff. You know, um, like I said, I'm not going to get into everybody I was listening to. I was constantly coming across information that I just couldn't refute. As I told myself, I was going to accept the truth no matter where it came from and, and that I was I was going to accept it. I wasn't going to reject it just because it wasn't how I grew up or what I came up with. No. If it was tr if it made sense and added up and added actually added value, then why not disregard the antiquated information and go with what works and what makes sense. And that's pretty much been my journey. I say this, anything that can't be questioned can't be trusted. We're constantly told don't question God though, but we're told to trust God. Well, if I'm to put some trust in you, I should be able to question something or ask some type of question to gain further clarity on certain things. If you have all the answers, but I'm not supposed to question you, yet I'm told asking it shall be given, seeking you shall find. Knocking the door shall be open, but I'm also told to lean out on my understanding. How do you live a reasonable, logical, balanced life trying to do two things that cancel out each other. What I want you to do, whether you agree with me or not, whether you think I'm correct, and this is just only one installment of me telling parts of my story, I just wanted to give an overview. Do as I do. If it doesn't make sense, don't just default back to what you were told was the plug-in answer. Now, granted, there are some things that happen that none of us can explain. But also, just because you can't explain them doesn't automatically mean a God did it. Because I can't prove that any more than I said Spider-Man did it. Prove God did it, I prove Spider-Man did it. And we'll both come back with the same amount of evidence. None. And people say, well, who do you think woke you up this morning? Spider-Man. And I'm using that just to say, I, you have no more evidence of a God waking you up than you do of Spider-Man. Even if you believe God did it, you don't have enough evidence for your arguments in the Bible or in this, the biblical God. Someone may say, well, do you believe in God? Some days I do. I believe I'm a God. But some days I believe in a higher power. Some days I question it. Some days I don't. And I, I, I feel I have the freedom to do that. Because when I look around the world and I see how the world is progressively getting worse in certain areas, it's still some good here, but it's progressively getting worse in some areas. It's like, how fucked up do it got to get for you? Come back, Jesus. A whole fucking pandemic just happened. They trying to put chips in. All um, VR taking over, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, all these different things happening that makes it seem like things going to implode at some point. Fuck you wait no. If I love my kids that much or my family that much, I'm going to go get them, son. I'm not going to be waiting forever. Well, let me... Um, let me... No, not yet. Let me get a little bit more fucked up. You want me to go God? No, no, no. They ain't fucked up enough. Ain't enough. Ain't enough people. Ain't enough black men got shot and killed yet. Ain't, ain't enough women been taken, taken, taken advantage of and molested yet. Ain't enough kids died from hunger and and been taken advantage of yet. Ain't enough school systems failed yet. Don't go back yet, Jesus. Let them get a little bit more fucked up. Ain't enough people got cancer and lupus and sickle cell and diabetes and things of that nature. Let them get a little bit more fucked up before you go back and get them. Ain't enough people on welfare, my nigga. I need more people on welfare, my nigga. Don't go back and get them yet. 
Like, how fucked up do it gotta be? But somebody would say that's blasphemous. No, it's blasphemous that your supreme being lets you have to dwell amongst this and convince yourself that all you have to do is pray and fast more and believe more for it to get better. When actually we the answers to our prayers, but we were taught we had to look up instead of looking within, to look within ourselves to say, you know what? L let me go inside, heal my insides so that I can present something healed to my, my, my people. And when your people are doing the same thing, we ain't got to look up. We can look at each other then. Because we've done the inner work. It took me almost 40 some years to even learn about what doing any type of inner work was. With being honest with myself. Walking in my own truth out of fear of what this person going to say. Or still having that fear that that belief was so strong that I didn't have a right to say, I don't believe it. Because I know some people will automatically think you're a bad person. You're a bad person for thinking that I'm a bad person. But you don't get that. You're a bad person for even judging me for that. When your own leader, Jesus, went around everybody. Paul and then went around everybody. He pretty much said, I went around all them. I became like them so I could win some. So according to them stories, they was in the mix with people that might not have necessarily believed like them. And they didn't go in there judging them. They ain't go beating them over the head with their beliefs, to my knowledge. But as soon as you find out somebody, Jehovah's Witness, y'all like Jehovah's Witnesses ain't shit. Crazy part is you could work with a person and, and, and fuck with them on the work tip until you find out their religious belief. Then you'll back away from them for that. Something that's imaginary. Something that you can't put your hands on. You'll back away from them. You might not. you have a friendly beef over your football team, your basketball team. or Politics can kind of mess it up too, but religion? And don't let it be somebody like myself. That don't rock with none of it. And it's actually probably a more genuine person than some that do. Because I ain't trying to mask nothing. I'm just me. Now I'm not going to give you all of me all at one time in every setting. But it's some of y'all that's hiding who you really are. Behind some of your titles and stuff. And if you hear what I'm saying, you're hearing what I'm saying. I'd rather you just be who you are. Didn't have to hide it behind something because of your belief system. Because you're doing it but torturing yourself and misleading other people. When you're more blessing the people when you can be yourself. And believe in the powers that are in you, the God that is in you, the power to create. The power to build and destroy. The power to speak life or death with your words. The power to work with your hands and build something. The power to work with your mind and build something. We are the creators. I put my dick in a vagina and I make a baby. She, well, she makes the baby, but we create a life together. If that ain't God, that's not God. That's more proof of God than somebody taking some dirt, rubbing it together and making a person out of some mud or something. And I could go deeper into this. But that's how, that's part of how I'm at this place. In other videos, I'm going I'm to talk about dealing with people. Because even now, I, people will change. They'll say it's you. And of course, there will be some changes. But some of the people around you will change. And the love and the energy will change. Even though you still have the same love for them. Just because you say, I don't do this no more. Some of them you won't ever talk to again. But God is love, right? They'll call you crazy. But God is love, right? They say you mad, you bitter. Well, sometimes you will be. 
Because you get tired of dealing with the ignorance and people not realizing that just like you have a right to speak your side of it, I have a right to speak my side of it. You don't have a monopoly or dictatorship over who can speak about religious or non-religious things. You don't get to be automatically right because you're a Christian. But a lot of you are making it as if you're more right than anyone. First starting with other religions and then especially don't be a non-religious person. Y'all really feel like y'all the upper tier of humanity. Well, you're not. Think. As the great David Banner says, I don't care what you think. Just think. Allow yourself to think for you. Not not with the backing of the cliches and the rhetoric. When your natural mind thinks, when you ponder something, and that thought of what it could be pops in your head that you used to reject, no, dwell on that. Say, let me see. Let me see more to that. Stop letting people's ignorance paint everything as demonic. Everything is not demonic. People want to make astrology demonic when it ain't number but astrology and astronomy all through the Bible. We can get into that at another time. The 12 disciples and the sun and all of that. It's all the stars. It's all the signs. It's all of that. But y'all don't be wanting to study deep enough to even know that. You'll understand yourself better if you knew some of this stuff. But like I said, that's another, that's another whole episode at some point. Anyway, I think that's I think that's where I want to put a, a button into that. Because this only scratched the surface, man. Really only scratched the surface of more than an eight year journey, but the last eight years have been some of the most transformative years of my life, especially coming from my family background. Especially on my father's side, I, I shouldn't be saying the stuff that I say about religion and stuff. I shouldn't be speaking of God and Jesus and, and the church in the manner that I do coming from that background. But I do. Because I, I realized that way wasn't even really working for them. I thought it was. And it looked good for years until you get older and see, oh, that didn't even work for y'all either. It just looked like it did. I didn't want to be that. I didn't want to look like to the world, I got it going on and I'm this and that. Nah. L let me be who I am for real. Whether that's me being broke or me having some money. Let, let me be me. Let me learn me. Let me walk in my truth. And that truth is that I'm going to question a lot of things. And the answer I get might not be the answer that you were programmed to believe it should be. But if you would take the time to think listen and process you'll realize there's more to it there's more out there but anyway if you've taken the time to tune in I really really appreciate you if you're new here hit that subscribe button if you like the type of content comment below hit that thumbs up button give me that that thumbs up leave a comment talk to me y'all talk to me man we here we here now. Let's take it up. You don't have to be afraid. Well, even if you are afraid, let's build a community of people that can talk to each other. And look, if this ain't for you, go to something else. You don't have to bring your negativity here. Just go to something else. Go over to T.D. Jakes and them channel or something. Let them do what they do for you. You don't have to stay here. But if you appreciate what I'm doing, Appreciate the content and looking forward to more conversations. Hit that subscribe button. Stay engaged. I really appreciate y'all taking the time to listen to me. I hope something connects with somebody. I'll holler at y'all later. Peace.